Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Tahar Khan. I'm a research fellow in defense and foreign policy studies at the Cato Institute. The Taliban has held power in Afghanistan for one year now. Yesterday, the Taliban and their supporters held a parade to mark the day. Now, while the United States and its allies maintain sanctions on the group, Afghans are living through a humanitarian and economic disaster. For example, roughly 25 million Afghans are now living in poverty, well over half the population, and the United Nations estimate that up to 900,000 jobs could be lost this year as the economy stalls. Since taking over, the Taliban has made several promises, such as offering amnesty to soldiers who are members of the Afghan National Security Forces, working toward an Afghan Islamic inclusive government, engaging other stakeholders in a transition council, and allowing girls to attend schools. However, the group has failed to uphold several of its commitments. For example, there's mounting evidence of repraisal killings, and the UN has documented 160 cases to date. According to the Biden administration, the group has also grossly violated its commitment not to give shelter to Al-Qaeda by allowing the group's leader, Ayman al-Zawahiri, who was recently killed in a U.S. drone strike, to stay in a safe house in Kabul. This is also one of the reasons why the Biden administration has decided not to release the roughly seven billion in foreign aids held, uh, foreign assets held by Afghanistan's central bank on U.S. soil, and has suspended talks with the Taliban. Now, what does this, um, th what does the Taliban's evolution mean for U.S. policy? And does the United States have the tools available to push the group in the direction that policymakers wanted to go? And what U.S. interests remain in Afghanistan today? Um, to discuss these questions and more, I'm delighted to introduce you to three experts and scholars whose work I have uh, followed closely and also greatly admire. So joining us today is Mr. Andrew Watkins. He is a senior expert on Afghanistan for the U.S. Institute of Peace. His research focuses on insurgency in Afghanistan, regional engagement in the Afghanistan conflict, and challenges and opportunities for the humanitarian access. Um, he has written extensively on the phenomena of cohesion and fragmentation within the Taliban. And for those who are interested, I would highly recommend his latest paper in the CTC, Sentinel on the Group. And so today he's going to talk to us about the Taliban's current challenges. After him, we have Dr. Hassan Abbas, who is a professor of international security studies and the chair of the Department of Regional and Analytical Studies at National Defense University's College of International Security Affairs. His research focuses on building narratives for countering political and religious extremism, and rule of law reforms in developing countries. Um, and so today he will be discussing the Taliban's political evolution and how they came to be in the position they are today, which is the government of Afghanistan, even though no country has officially recognized the Taliban as such. He also has um, a book coming out on the Taliban that he'll also uh, mention today. Um, Mr. Mustafa Aikul is a senior fellow at the Cato Institute's Center for Global Liberty and Prosperity, where he focuses on the intersection of public policy, Islam, and modernity. As such, he will be discussing the group's religious evolution and how the Taliban's quest for religious um, legitimacy has shaped their religiosity. And finally, I will discuss why this all matters for U.S. interests and what U.S. policymakers need to do, even if there are no American troops on the ground anymore. With that, Andrew, the floor is yours. Thanks so much. It's really a privilege to be here um, with with such distinguished co-panelists. Uh, appreciate Cato Institute's invitation. I, I wanted to start by underscoring a, a bottom line assessment from the beginning, which is that the Taliban are likely to be in power and, and remain relatively uncontested uh, in their control of Afghanistan for the foreseeable future. Um, but much as was true during the course of the last 20 years of war, this is not a reflection of the Taliban's uh, strength as an organization, uh, and, and it doesn't account for the Taliban's many institutional flaws, their shortcomings, and the challenges that they face. It's a relative assessment of their strength. What we're talking about is a vacuum, a political and military vacuum that now exists in Afghanistan. Uh, all other Afghan political actors have been uh, weakened, delegitimized, or driven out of the country almost entirely, as, as much of the former political leadership of an entire generation was during the evacuation and the collapse of, of the Islamic Republic a year ago 
uh, yesterday. Um, I think it, this is a bit of a different conversation, but it reflects that there had been a vacuum that was growing and widening for much longer than, than many of us observing Afghanistan wanted to admit. Um, looking back at what happened a year ago, the Taliban transition into government as secure as they may be for the foreseeable future today, uh, their establishment and consolidation of control was not a foregone conclusion a year ago. As rapid as the collapse of the Afghan government was, uh, the Taliban were in quite a fragile position themselves. They had overstretched in a military capacity in a way that they had really never done in the past 20 years of their insurgency. The uh, Taliban were caught by surprise, so much so that some of their senior most leaders in the days that followed after the collapse of Kabul admitted that they hadn't themselves in their wildest dreams anticipated being able to move into Kabul and take control of the country as quickly as they did. Um, <clears throat> they didn't waste any time, however, and we were surprised and, and uh, I think in, in, in some begrudging ways, impressed by how quickly the Taliban asserted their control over the organs of the state. In particular, we have to look at how quickly, though they may have been surprised, took control of state-run media and asserted their uh, domination of the information landscape in Afghanistan. Uh, state-run media in the country were broadcasting Taliban programming in the same day, just hours after several hundred fighters uh, of the Taliban entered into Kabul while they were still rummaging through former government offices. This set a trend early on that showed us whatever shortcomings and difficulties the Taliban had, they were very comfortable with actions to consolidate their control. Uh, this plays into a strength of the Taliban as a militant movement and, and as having waged an insurgency against adversaries for almost two decades. Uh, what they were good at was identifying threats, uh, consolidating their own forces, and moving to eliminate those threats. Again, they were accustomed to doing this through violence, through the use of force, often even through acts of terrorism. Something that we've seen this trend continued through their first year in power. Anywhere in Afghanistan where potential resistance or uh, rebellion against their authority has risen, we've seen them follow a, a, a fairly consistent playbook which is to flood the area with their own fighters, to move in, to use the violence that they deem necessary, and to shut the area down. And then afterwards, if possible, to uh, ensue political negotiations. They were able to clamp down on anti-Taliban resistance in the notorious uh, and, and in, uh, you know, famed province of Panjshir in the country that held out against the Taliban all throughout the 1990s uh, but in the Taliban's return to power last year, lasted less than two weeks before the Taliban were able to claim control. So we really need to learn something from the way the Taliban was able to move and, and to dominate in a military sense. But it's also important to note a shift uh, from, from how they behaved several decades ago and, and all throughout their insurgency. The Taliban have been shifting to what I would call calculated coercion using uh, not as little violence as possible, but selectively applying and targeting violence. That's both in a military sense and uh, in a social sense, in terms of repression, of political opposition, of dissenting speech. Uh, as you noted, uh, there are uh, more than 100 cases, some media outlets and human rights uh, watchdogs claim up to 500 documented cases or more of extrajudicial, extrajudicial killings and disappearances. Um, but this is also standing in comparison and in context to tens of thousands of veterans of the former government's armed forces, which have been largely left alone by the Taliban. This is in contrast to tens of thousands of civil servants 
whom Taliban propaganda several years ago told us were collaborators and deserving of the harshest punishment, but today have been very pragmatically called back in to man the same offices now under Taliban supervision. So this transition from indiscriminate use of violence to very calculated violence and coercion, I think is a huge trend of the Taliban this past year. On bigger questions of governance, uh, what the future Afghan state is going to look like, the Taliban have proven that they themselves still don't know and that they really entered into power without having much firm idea at all. Taliban policymaking has revealed itself to be more and more of a mess as the group has moved through its first year in power. We have to remember that this is a movement that even when it was in control in the 1990s, never wrote down their core principles. This group doesn't have a foundational text. In spite of several attempts to draft a constitution throughout their history, they've never been able to reach consensus uh, on anything beyond two basic ideas. One is to eject the foreign influences that they believe have corrupted and ruined their country. And two is the very vague notion of establishing a pure Islamic system, which again, they've never really spelled out what that means. A lot of that goes back to the flexibility that they applied in, in order to win their insurgency against much stronger military powers. Uh, if you were willing to fight against the United States and the Afghan government that it backed, the Taliban really weren't going to quibble with you over what your, your policy beliefs were. They wanted you to join the fight, and they employed a policy ambiguity to widen their tent. That's led to a really interesting development, an emergence of dueling centers of power uh, between the government the Taliban has established in Kabul versus the seat of power where their supreme leader sits in the southern city of Kandahar. The Taliban call their government an Islamic emirate. Uh, the head, the supreme leader, is called the emir. But I also want to step back and again refer to their time as an insurgency. Just a moment. In theory, the Taliban's leader is a supreme ruler endowed with authority from God uh, directly. In reality, the Taliban proved pragmatic after the last two decades. In order for their insurgency to survive, they had to compromise. Again, if you were willing to join the fight, if you were willing to replenish the Taliban's ranks, which were, were depleted every year in this costly, bloody war, the Taliban's leadership gave local fighters a great deal of autonomy. But now that compromise isn't necessary because there's no more war to fight. And the dynamic between the fighters and the leadership is changing. And so we see the emir in Kandahar and the people closest to him trying to reassert the supremacy of his rule over the movement. That's leading to some ideological divides that are growing and a divergence in policy views. Again, which goes back to how unprepared the Taliban really may have been to take power. I think that's plenty that we can discuss further on, but I want to leave it there and hand it back over. Thanks so much. Thank you so much for that, Andrew. That was great. Um, Hassan, over to you. Thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity. I'm truly honored um, and great to see my two our friends, Andrew and Mustafa, a very minor correction, not correction and addition. I'm still at the uh, National Defense University and still professor, but I moved from uh, the College of International Security Affairs, which is an excellent institution, uh, to Near East South Asia Center for Strategic Studies, uh, Department of Defense um, think tank. Uh, but all that I'm going to say are my personal opinions, I'm required to say. Uh, so it is great to first hear Andrew because he has made my job much easier I'm going to talk about the origin and the genesis of Taliban, but I could not have explained it uh, without um, Andrew's uh, great insights. I would divide Taliban into the Taliban life into three phases. Taliban one is when Taliban came into being um, early 1990s, 1993, 94, until 1999, so after which they were, or 2000 when they were ousted. Uh, that's Taliban 1.0. Then Taliban 2.0, for the purpose of clarity and ease, is the phase of insurgency. And now I think they are trying to become Taliban 
uh, but they will try to struggle between their their identity, their um, worldview, um, how they perceive themselves also through the lens of Taliban 1.0 and then uh, Taliban 2.0. What do we mean by Taliban, the original Taliban? Uh, first and foremost, they were a product of history, uh, like most movements are, but there's something more to it. They were also a product of history which had gone through one, a military conflict, which we call the Afghan Jihad. Um, secondly, also uh, a product of history in terms of the rural urban divide that was so entrenched in Afghanistan. Um, third was uh, another geopolitical context, uh, contest where uh, the, the, there were regional players which were always uh, interested, Pakistan uh, at the forefront, but other countries in the region as well. They have a huge history with Iran, for example, in Herat and every, everything else. The, the Dari language is a, a dialect of Persian language. The Pashtuns also, of course, the, divided between Pakistan um, and Afghanistan. So there was there was that factor at play. And then there was this entrenched tribalism. Uh, so they were a, Taliban were a product in a sense that they were number one reactionaries. When they came into form in 93, 94, it was a reactionary movement. It was also a revolutionary movement. But it had the reaction was to frustration. It, the reaction was to total disappointment because they had won the war, so to say, in the shape of Afghan Mujahideen with the religious ideals and religious model against a much, much more powerful uh, uh, world power at that time. And then they saw um, Hikmat Yar and Ahmad Masood Shah and everyone else trying to kill each other. Ahmad Shah Masood and primarily but uh, Hikmat Yar. He had bombed Kabul out of Samidrians. He had destroyed Kabul. So these were the young folks who had fought in that whole jihad or had seen that. And they were looking for an idealism and dream that now is the time Afghanistan will be a pure independent state, religious state, because the, the idea of jihad um, had really um, was something that was inspiring them. And what they saw was chaos. So it was, so it was a reaction. They wanted something new. In that reaction, there were two things which we have to keep in mind. One, this idea of a frustrated young person who is his idealism, who all he knows is the, how to use the weapon. And then for many of their leaders, they were educated from the Pakistani madrasas. Which madrasas? Madrasas, this religious seminary, mostly Sunni, Hanafi, uh, Deobandi schools. Um, there were Shias as well who were part of this, but those are partly uh, on, on, under a different umbrella. But the, the Sunni, Hanafi, Deobandis were a product of one school, for example, Akora Khatak, uh, which is called the Madrasa Hakaniya, from where all the today's Hakanis, they, they got that name uh, because of that. Many people mistakenly think uh, Pakistan, Pakistan's former Prime Minister Imran Khan was under the misperception as well that Hakanis are a tribe. No, Hakanis are not a tribe. Uh, this is a title. Anyone who is a graduate of that school, uh, which was initially Jalaluddin Hakani, uh, that that's how the name came into force uh, also a family name in some ways the point i'm making these taliban when they had come into power were a product of history reactionary revolutionary graduates of the pakistani madrasas and also one other factor which is also relevant to the, the present crisis in the world that we are seeing many of them were refugees they were the refugees who were thrown out of afghanistan during the uh, uh, the war with soviet union and they had, number one, intermingled with the militants from all over the world. We know from the former Pakistani intelligence chief, uh, uh, who, Hamid Gul, who had said they had trained 30,000 people who were from Morocco, Egypt, any, everywhere else. That's what made into Al-Qaeda. Those were all the folks who, who were there. So these young Pakistani, come Afghan, Pashtuns, uh, Madrasa students had intermingled with them. That That's the... That's the history which we have to keep in mind. So when they came into power, so to say, in 94, 95, um, there was a lot of energy. They were young, but very rigid. And that's important to know because that rigidity you will see show itself in so many ways even today. Um, but they were not trained. They had no exposure um, of the modern world in any sense. Today, of course, the new Taliban have the iPhones in their hands and they have a very different worldview because of the exposure and interaction. I was interviewing one person for a book that I'm writing, The Return of the Taliban uh, for Yale University Press. This is, um, I was interviewing somebody uh, for this book. This is still three, four months away, but I'm thankful uh, for, for this title here. I was interviewing somebody 
um, uh, a former Pakistani, uh, actually intelligence uh, 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 leader, or he was he held a very senior position. And I asked him, "You dealt with the old Taliban uh, and the new Taliban. What's the difference? Because I'm trying to figure out in, in theory is the, is this what we are seeing is the new Taliban?" And he said something very interesting. He said, "Look, the previous Taliban or the old Taliban or the classic old guard." All what they had done was they traveled from Kandahar to maybe Kabul, but mostly Peshawar, Kora Khattak, Pakistan's tribal belt. And he said the new Taliban have seen the world. Doha, Beijing, Moscow, they have traveled around the world. UAE, they have businesses. Mullah Mansoor, uh, the, uh, the successor of uh, Mullah Omar, was killed in a strike, a drone strike, because he was returning from uh, Iran. And previous to that, he was in, uh, in UAE where, where he, he was running a business. The point I'm making, he said to me, the general, he said the old Taliban um, ha had very limited experience. And the new Taliban, so to say, same mindset in terms of religion, politics, history, inspiration, but they have seen the world and they, have, they really like the new world that they are seeing. So the, but, but my topic is the old Taliban or the genesis. So they uh, were rigid. Uh, very dogmatic tribalism had more an impact of their on their worldview rather than religion per se and then having that degree from a, a, a militant uh, philosophy at, at that time the the Diobandism originally which which i know my other colleagues know better than me and they'll they'll correct me it was a religious conservative movement but what it had become um during the Afghan Jihad was a militant Diobandi movement, which was very different from the original Diobandi worldview. That's what the Taliban were a product of. Um, very uncouth, or uh, they were not um, trained uh, in any modern statecraft. Uh, Kabul was, there was no ministries. It was in any case destroyed. But just one example, and then I'll um, stop, uh, was that when, this is from uh, one of the original works on Taliban, when the Ministry of Finance, used to be a big box that was under the bed of Mullah Omar. Anyone who comes to him for money, gifts, some special thing, that's what he would give. Uh, there, there was no modern finance systems that were in place. Uh, that is just an example, maybe a little unfair example, but just to give you an idea of the infrastructure, of the setups that they had. No, this was a rural movement, um, not grassroots movement at that time, a militant movement, reactionary um, with 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 a general idea that they want in pure Islamic state but had no clue they, I personally think they still have not much clue about what they really mean by that but at that time it was in a very very early stage that's where I will stop um, because I thought that that context uh, will, will give us uh, some idea into how to interpret uh, the modern day Taliban's uh, world back to Islam. Thank you, Hassan. That was really helpful, especially to set up the context, because I think oftentimes we forget that the Taliban, when we use phrases like old Taliban, new Taliban, we sometimes forget what that really means and what some of the differences are. And as you mentioned, and even as Andrew mentioned as well, there are some stark differences that will help us sort of understand how the country is moving forward and also the group itself and, and how it's evolving. So Mustafa, over to you to talk about the religious aspect. Thank you, Sahar. Thank you for leading the discussion and for Hassan and Andrew for joining us. Um, I just want to begin with a comparison. I mean, Western audiences and the world in general in the past 10 years have seen two different movements that, you know, with arms, with weapons, capture the part of land and said, we are establishing an Islamic state, right? An, an Islamic system here. Uh, the first one was the infamous ISIS, uh, sometimes called simply IS or you know, Islam, the Islamic State, uh, which uh, has been, I mean, after long battles and efforts, you know, pushed back and destroyed in its base, but still it has, it has an offshoot uh, in, in, in Afghanistan and as far as too, but known as ISK, for example, ISIS Khorasan. Uh, and the other one is, of course, the Taliban. So in, Afga in Afghanistan, but there are also significant differences between these two uh, groups. ISIS was the most fanatic, ferocious, violent, savage group the world has ever seen acting in the name of Islam. I mean, if, that, if there's a spectrum of political Islamists or, uh, or groups that want to have political action in the name of Islam to capture a state and establish their land, that was 
that was the most fanatic edge and that's why isis uh all with all their destruction they uh, they great they gave great harm to iraq and syria and a lot of populations there uh, but they were also, and they attracted some uh, souls from different parts of the world, but they were condemned universally almost by all other Muslim Muslims uh, because their ideology was an offshoot of Salafi, Takfiri, Jihadism. You know, it's a very specific line, uh, which was which is unacceptable for majority of conservative Muslims. That's why you've seen a global condemnation by Muslims of, of ISIS. Uh, but the Taliban, compared to ISIS, is a relatively more moderate force, uh, which makes it, by the way, more compelling, uh, more more appealing, you know, to 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 some conservatives or new groups around the world, which I'll come in a bit. Uh, Taliban, compared to ISIS, is more moderate in the sense that, uh, for example, ISIS would kill any Shiite for see, simply being a quote unquote heretic or apostate. Uh, Taliban wouldn't do that, you know. Uh, they actually began with some rapprochement with the Shiites after they're uh, coming to power. But still, they there are doubts about what will they do to Shiites in, Afga in Afghanistan, the Hazara community, especially the ethnic group, uh, which is historically coming from the Shiite tradition, because they still consider them as somewhat of heretics, but, you know, they're not like ISIS. Uh, or ISIS claimed a caliphate, you know, that, that is a global ambition. Taliban has a milder ambition called, uh, they call it an Islamic Emirate. So they're, say, they're saying we just want an Islamic state in our country, which is Afghanistan. So in that sense, Taliban is a milder force compared to ISIS. And that is why policymakers would actually find Taliban preferable to ISIS and even uh, potentially as an ally. And that would not be, I think, a wrong assessment. An analogy that would come to my mind uh, from the Cold War would be the struggle between the Viet Cong and the Khmer Rouge. Khmer Rouge was the most violent savage of all communist groups that you know took uh, Cambodia in four years, uh, and and they 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 committed genocide, uh, one fourth of the population. So that is similar to ISIS. That was similar to ISIS, and and Viet Cong was Vietnamese communists still fought American forces, actually pushed them out, liberated their country, established an authoritarian system. But actually, and they fought the Khmer Rouge later. And it was good news that, you know, they uh, they defeated the Khmer Rouge. So there, there are these nuances between these groups that any policymaker should see and not put them into one basket. However, uh, as moderate as it is compared to ISIS and as as evolved as it is, compared to its Taliban 1.0, as Hassan said uh, in his uh, in his uh, part uh, in, in the 90s, you know, they were more violent. They were destroying, you know, uh, statues and on women. They were more savage, certainly. They have they seem to have taken a few steps. They are using more calculated coercion. Again, a good term that Andrew uh, introduced here. But still, it's very concerning for anyone who thinks of human rights, uh, women's rights in particular, minority rights, just freedom of religion and, and speech and individual freedom in general. And uh, that is because, I mean, the Taliban as basic concept is creating a Sharia state and, and also justifying their power, their unchallenged power through that success of creating that state, right? Uh, so let me ex try to explain what I'm trying to say here. Uh, I mean, Sharia is a legal tradition of Islam, and for great majority of Muslims, it's a respected concept. It's the divine practice. It's the divine law. You fast in Ramadan. That's Sharia. Based on the Sharia, Muslim women think that you know there are certain conservative dress codes. You can you know uh, uh, choose one of those. But for a lot of Muslims around the world, that is something that's voluntarily. You, mean you fast in Ramadan because you believe in God worship or you have a certain dress code and you, because you want to be pious. Now, when you make the Sharia the law of the land, in law and one central government, typically what you do is uh, you, you go towards religious. So what you do is actually take one interpretation of the Sharia, your interpretation of the Sharia, and impose it to society. That's very clearly in the bond's decision on women. Uh, for, for example, 
uh, terrible things, decisions they made was the closure of schools, uh, girls' schools. I think they're allowing primary schools, but after that, secondary schools and other education is still banned, and, and there's no time, there's no, uh, there's no light at the end of a tunnel at this, at this point, despite their earlier promises. But for example, another thing they brought is they said a woman cannot travel without a male guardian, right? Uh, that's why women are not allowed to get on a taxi and, and, and or you go or get on a bus and to go to a different city in, in Afghanistan. Now, this is how they interpret, right? This is a lot of Muslims around the world would say, well, there's no problem in this because the idea that women should not travel alone comes from a medieval time when it was dangerous for women to tr go around to travel alone. So the Prophet Muhammad sayings about this was about that context, but it is fine right now. But what sh what the Taliban does is to Im impose their interpretation on all society. They think music is haram; that's religiously banned, which means it's not that they they don't they don't sell cells you know refrain from music. They you know ban it to the whole population. That's why this is a religious dictatorship. Uh, and I think it will be a lesson, another lesson for Muslims around the world, including very conservative ones, to see that it's not a good idea to have what you call a Sharia state. Because what you end up is one group that defines what the Sharia is in their own understanding, whether it's a form of the Obandi, uh, Zim, which is a form of Hanafism, a strict form of Hanafism, uh, and that becomes the law of the land. So you, as a Muslim, you are deprived of your own agency to decide on how you will dress, what you will live, and how will you practice your religion. Uh, and also, uh, this dictatorship model has another problem that comes uh, as a part of the package. Because they are implementing the Sharia, they think that this, this gives them full legitimacy. They're asking the Afghani people, are you happy to be under the Taliban rule? Right. I mean, I recently saw a Taliban clip in English, actually, where there was an Ashid, a song like a religious. The Afghan people want the Taliban. You know, they were like sending the Taliban is what the Afghan people want. Well, we don't know what the Afghan people want because they never made elections. And right. They never ran for elections in a competitive system and saying, do you really want us to govern? Uh, someone can say, well, they liberated a country from occupation. Well, even in that case, okay, now they can, they should, will they release, will they announce dates for uh, free elections? No, that's not, uh, they, they assume that because they're implementing Islamic law, their version of Islamic law, that gives them legitimacy. And that's why they can ban uh, news that criticize them. You know, they had recent uh, dictates to the media about all those uh, basically cracking down on dissent against them and, and preventing any criticism against them. So I think the lesson from uh, this experience, which we'll, we'll see in the years ahead, I think, for Muslims around the world would be to say, well, if we want to be good Muslims, maybe we don't need things like the, we don't need systems like what the Taliban promises us, the Taliban or similar groups broadly called the Islamists, which is an Islamic state governed by Sharia, interpreted by one group. It is a state that actually gives us just religious freedom, a secular state with respect uh, for uh, religious freedom and, and, and civil liberties and, and, and the fundamental human rights. Uh, in, in such a system, you would be able to be a Muslim in the way you believe in it, not, not that it's dictated by the government. So, there, so Taliban is presenting us an interesting Uh, Mustafa, I'm so sorry, but I think we lost your audio. So could you just see if your audio is back on? Sorry, we won't be. It seems like we can't hear you again. Um, do you want to refresh and maybe try that? Uh, I mean, yes, Andrew, um, if you actually want to take it from here while Mustafa adjusts his audio, that would be great. Yeah, absolutely. Um, to to pick up on some of Mustafa's points on uh, 
the Taliban's domination of, of their interpretation of Islamic law and, and their belief in their own legitimacy on the ground in Afghanistan, he's absolutely right. This has had alarming effects because the combination of the last 20 years or to, to Dr. Abbas's point, the last 45 years of Afghan and regional history uh, the Taliban are able to point to a few things. One, as I noted briefly, the illegitimacy of all other political actors, all those, according to the Taliban, that were corrupted by their involvement with uh, the Western-led intervention after 9-11, uh, but even those who came before um, in, in the era of Soviet invasion, its aftermath, the bloody civil war across Afghanistan, the Taliban point to this history and they say, uh, both because of their own uh, self-evaluated Islamic credentials, but also uh, political events, we are the only actor entitled to rule Afghanistan. And therefore, they don't see the need to consult with the Afghan people and to certainly not include any other actors from across Afghanistan. And that's proven to be problematic uh, because of how much mistrust and suspicion has grown over time, how many acts of violence one group has done to another, one ethnic community to another. Uh, the ethnic uh, Hazara and, and Shia majority uh, community, as Mustafa noted in particular, um, has often been marginalized and persecuted. Um, and then finally, you have uh, ethnic dimensions to the Taliban's own superiority conflict complex that are layered onto its religious dogma, uh, where the Taliban's leadership still stems from a southern ethnically Pashtun constituency that, as, as Hassan referred to, uh, has dominated Afghan uh, leadership and most Afghan governments for most of the past 200 years. Afghans can't ignore this, and they can't ignore the way that the Taliban have grafted religious justifications onto a very bloody and political and, and realpolitik uh, seizure of power and, and the Taliban's desire to be a centralizing government in a state that has always seen movements like theirs try to centralize their power. Maybe I'll hand it back over. Um, yes, Andrew, I agree. And I think another important point that we should sort of keep in mind as well is that the Taliban, and this is something that I think all three of you touched on, it's the evolution of the Taliban in terms of what they're looking for. And I think one of the main distinctions that we see in sort of the Taliban that's operating in Afghanistan today is something that Hassan mentioned as well, which is that they're more well-traveled and, and the Taliban actually have somewhat of a foreign policy, which I think has, for some of us, at least for me, has been surprising to see over the past you know, 10 to 15 years, where I feel in the past, they weren't that concerned with um, getting legitimacy from the international community and even from their neighbors. They were more concerned with being the only leader in, in um, Afghanistan. But now we see that they're on this quest to get international legitimacy and international recognition. And this is, I think, one of the, the main differences that we see from sort of the old Taliban and, and, and today's Taliban now. But I wanted to um, hand over to Mustafa and see if his audio is back on to see if he could con continue with his comments. Oh, Mustafa, we still can't hear you. So okay, so we will, um, so I will try to uh, get back to Mustafa once um, the audio is, is fixed on his end. Um, but really quickly, I wanted to thank all three of you for your comments. I think this has been a great, um, you know, this has been a great discussion and, and, and um, sort of a great uh, summary points from all three views of sort of what's going on with the Taliban today and, and where they came from and sort of what to expect now. Um, and very briefly, I just wanted to touch on some things that I always get asked on, which is basically, you know, now that the U.S. troops are out of Afghanistan, 
Um, what is this, why is Afghanistan important for the United States? And especially as um, on, in technical terms, at least they, the US war in Afghanistan is over, there are no ground troops anymore. So why should Americans care about Afghanistan? And again, what kind of goals or US interests is engagement with Afghanistan meeting? Now, I think there's several things to sort of think about, but I wanted to talk about uh, two in particular. The first has been this conception that Afghanistan will remain a safe haven for terrorist groups. And just currently on, on July um, 31st, actually Al-Qaeda's leader, Ayman al-Zawahiri, was killed um, in, a, in a US drone strike and he was uh, finding refuge in, in Kabul. And it's raised some concerns that perhaps Afghanistan is going to become a safe haven for terrorists again, especially for Al-Qaeda, which is a group that, that wants to attack the US homeland. And you have prominent voices like General Frank McKinsey, who's basically used this one-year withdrawal anniversary to argue that um, the U.S. intervention should have continued basically in, indefinitely. Um, we also have some polling data, and polling um, shows that Americans are second-guessing the wisdom of exiting Afghanistan as well. Support has plunged about 20 points last August and has stayed around 50% 50, 50 since then. Yet the consensus um, view of the U.S. intelligence community is that Al-Qaeda has not reconstituted its presence in Afghanistan since U.S. With, uh, forces withdrew, and that the U.S. intelligence in Afghanistan continues to remain strong, even though U.S. troops have left. So. This idea that perhaps, um, you know, that Afghanistan and Taliban again will fall into becoming a safe haven for terrorist groups is, is not really um, based on, on strong empirical information. But again, what does this all mean for the Biden administration? Now, I, I think that it is essential that the Biden administration and Congress create a plan of engagement with Afghanistan that focuses on diplomacy and basic needs. And the first step in that direction would be to unfreeze Afghanistan's assets that remain in the New York Federal Reserve. But the Biden administration announced just yesterday that it won't release those assets because the Taliban was protecting Ayman al-Zawahiri. But without talks and the release of these assets, the U.S. is harming Afghans more. And it's not really changing the Taliban or, or changing what Andrew, you discussed, which is, um, you know, uh, cal a calculated coercion, they're not really impacting um, th the Taliban's calculated coercion in any sense by holding on to these assets. And I think the question that's important for the American public to think about is, is holding these assets really making a difference um, to the Taliban? And if nothing else, it's increasing more suffering for the Afghans, which is something that we should avoid at all costs. And also just from a regional point of view, if Afghanistan continues to weaken, then it will create further instability in Central and South Asia, which would be harmful in terms of um, violence, in terms of food security, and also in terms of the illicit drug trade, which I'm happy to um, answer questions about in the Q&A uh, moving forward. Um, but in addition to creating a feasible plan to engage with Afghanistan, the Biden administration must investigate the failures and deceit of the U.S. war in that country. And this has sort of been one of my own interests as well, is how, who do we hold within the United States? Who do we really hold accountable for the U.S. war in Afghanistan and all the failings that, that took place there? Now, currently, there seems to be some appetite for accountability in Congress. Um, the House um, Foreign Affairs Committee held two hearings on the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan as a way to evaluate its disastrous evacuation um, in the fall of 2021. And the Senate Foreign Relations Committee also held a hearing on the humanitarian on the humanitarian crisis that was unfolding with rapid speed in February of this year. But since then, there have been no hearings. And perhaps, you know, stinging from the politics of the botched withdrawal, President Biden didn't even mention Afghanistan in the State of the Union address, which I found really surprising as somebody who has watched the war very closely. If a 20 year war is, is, is ending, I would imagine that it should be mentioned in the State of the Union. Um, that said, you know, while Senator Tammy Duckworth's uh, nonpartisan commission to study the war in Afghanistan is, 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 is part of this fiscal year's National Defense Authorization Act, I think it's a welcome move. And the U.S. government needs to still have more public hearings on the U.S. involvement in the war there. Um, and one of the reasons why I say this is because it's important for the American public to hold U.S. policymakers and military leaders um, who misled American public on the war's progress accountable for all the misconceptions and misperceptions about Afghanistan, especially in terms of Afghanistan's reconstruction,
the waste that occurred and the rampant uh, corruption that exists within the country as well. Now, the US government has spent more than two trillion on the war in Afghanistan, in addition to the lives of thousands of US service members and conservatively tens of thousands of civilians as well. If the Biden administration is serious about creating a human focused foreign policy, it needs to conduct an investigation into the US war in Afghanistan that spans domestic and international issues. So along with this, you know, one year anniversary that we're discussing and having this event on, instead of just also thinking about the Taliban and their evolution, I think the US needs to also think about its war on, and accountability on its end as well. So um, on that, um, as I'm also the moderator, and this is sort of one of the perks I enjoy being being the speaker and the moderator as well, is that I get to ask some of the first questions. And so I'll open this up to our whole panel over here, um, three distinguished voices I, I was um, able to um, invite. Thank you all very much for attending this event and, um, and for your thoughts as well. I wanted to ask actually about from all of you, your point of view on sort of Taliban's foreign policy and their their seeking legitimacy. All of you in your comments sort of mentioned this aspect, but I wanted to be a little more um, blatant and ask more specifically in your in each of your views, what kind of legitimacy is the Taliban seeking and why and whether or not they'll be able to achieve that legitimacy in the coming years. So, um, Mustafa, I'll start with you, just because we lost your audio. Am, am I, do you hear me right now? Yes. Am I? Yes, you are back. Audible? Great. <laughs> Thanks so much. And apologies for the technical problem. What was it? Um, right. Well, first of all, Sahar, I should tell you that I agree with you that Western governments, in particular the United States, should not punish the Afghan people by putting sanctions on the Taliban or holding the assets which is unfortunately a policy that's likely to go on, uh, as we understand from the recent statements. Uh, I mean, the, the, are they achieving, right? What's the goal here when they will be lifted? If, the, if, if there are sanctions for, uh, so what, what is the end game here? We've seen this before in the 90s when sanctions were put on Iraq, which really only made Iraqi people suffer uh, children malnutrition and we still we, we have very terrible humanitarian situation in Afghanistan right now whatever we think of the, the Taliban we should care for the Afghan children who are not finding food and and people just bread to eat and malnourished according to uh, international figures by UN and other agencies like there are more than a million malnutrition children right now so I believe uh, as as tr troubling as the Taliban is both in terms of its human rights record and its international uh, its 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 place in the international scene uh, there should be an engagement and uh, care for the afghan people should be a priority i think for western governments and sanctions without you know concern for the humanitarian situation is just not a good policy it's it's neither helpful nor conscientious i think uh, regarding international uh, the international scene, the I just checked the numbers. I mean, who the Taliban have been talking to? You know, with, with, with how many diplomatic relations and, and meetings? And China is the number one uh, factor, followed uh, by Turkey and, and 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 Pakistan in terms of engagement with the Taliban. And I think Taliban is in following with Pakistan to some extent. Will try to attract some Chinese investment and some uh, some strategic maybe relationship with China, uh, which is also very curious, uh, explains that they're not, they have not said anything on the persecution of Uyghurs. I mean, if they're an Islamic Emirate caring for Islam and Muslims, I think the genocidal uh, campaign uh, on the Uyghurs by the Chinese regime would be concerned. Um, but just like the Pakistani government, uh, they, they don't seem to say anything about that because they don't want to offend China. Uh, so, oh, and I would still uh, be calling for Western governments to keep dialogue and uh, channels open and trying to engage the Taliban. And instead of sanctions, I think the the one thing you would want uh, in, in, in Afghanistan today is not to isolate it further and maybe only make China the only outlet possible, which will further deepen the anti-Western uh, and the illiberal uh, nature uh, of the regime. Uh, instead, engage and, and trying to make them a part of the global economy.
that will have a moderating effect generally it has that effect uh, and uh, taliban ultimately as oppressive as they are are saying this is a country it's an emirate just like there are islamic emirates you know in the gulf they also have sharia in their legal system so uh, they don't have also have democracies and this is a bad model to criticize uh, from a religious point of view from a uh, humane point of view from a secular point of view but uh, still i think engagement with the taliban would be the the, the wise path to follow by western governments Thank you, Mustafa. Um, Hassan, I would love to hear from you on this. Absolutely. Uh, uh, thank you so much. Uh, fascinating conversation. I have two or three points, and I'll try to be brief. Uh, but I'll link this idea of legitimacy and where Afghanistan wants to go and where Taliban, how they view themselves. Uh, I'll link this with one point you mentioned earlier, earlier, why U.S. is still interested in that. And I immediately picked a book on the side um, uh, of a of a verse from a leading poet uh, in the region, Dr. Muhammad Iqbal, who had said something, and I, it's, it may sound rhetorical part of it, I, I really believe in that. The English translation of that verse was that Asia is a body of, built of clay and water. Afghanistan is the heart in the body. If Afghanistan is in turmoil, the whole of Asia is in turmoil. If Afghanistan is in peace, the whole of Asia is in peace. I really believe in that. What we need to do is to look at the map where Afghanistan is. With Central Asia, China, Turkey, it's very obvious. Every country thinks they are center of the world. Uh, world. But, but Afghanistan actually connects uh, the regions uh, in, a, in, a, in a fashion no, one, no other country does. Um, whether this is trade or rivalry between China and India or between Pakistan and India, we have seen the geopolitics play because what was happening in, Pakistan, in Afghanistan is so central. Uh, second point is what it's very important for US to learn the right lessons, and Sahar, you had said so rightly, um, who, who's re held responsible for that? On one day, we were spending not tens of billions of dollars, trillions of dollars. And then on the other day, we have uh, uh, walked out just entirely. Is there a middle path? Is there, uh, will we learn from how we did? Uh, and because there'll be more such cases, if not similar, of similar nature, where US um, state building, uh, U.S. capacity building programs will do. We spend from Department of Defense um, millions of dollars on, on capacity building of our partner nations. We need to really understand where we went wrong in training the police and the rule of law systems in Afghanistan. Because every other day we'll be engaged with these programs. Uh, just trying to just forget about it is not going to uh, do, uh, do the trick. And in, in one word, if I have to say who's responsible, many people are, but it will ultimately, as the President was it President Kennedy? The buck stops here. The president, the, the 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 political leadership in this country. If the military was giving them wrong information or intelligence was failing in their job or the analysts, experts were not getting it right, uh, the politicians are supposed to do it. And all they needed to do was read the cigar reports that were funded by the U.S. Congress. Cigar reports for the last five six years were making everything clear. We, had, we were living in a delusion in this country, uh, and we missed uh, on these things. Sorry, I'm taking long, but coming, I wanted to build that to the point of legitimacy. I just want to raise a couple of questions. So yes, Taliban are brute, uh, crude, um, their human rights violations terrible. Um, so are, can you think of any other countries where women are facing such human rights violations? I, I can start counting, and I, I don't know where will I stop. Are there any other countries where human rights serious violations are happening? Middle East, Gulf countries, where minorities are being crushed, bullied, imprisoned. Uh, so uh, is Afghanistan, the Taliban are doing something so unique that no one else is doing? So why the criterion for Afghanistan is different than anyone else? Um, I want to stop myself by saying recognize them and send our ambassador there. But what I want to say that the current policy and approach that we are having about sanctions and about expectations is, is there's no precedent of that um, and that's why we need to refigure reconfigure um, and give them some incentives try to push them because what india had so rightly said and i'll close with that there are uh, conflicting opinions there are people among the taliban we know of mullah brother uh, we know of some new accounts that have started coming in we know what stanik zaid thought 
we know what the people in Doha that we talked to and we empowered and facilitated, some of them were, I not call them liberal or progressives, but they were very open to conversations, dialogue, engagement. Um, and what can we do to think of new things that empower them? I mean, that will be one way to look at these issues. Thank you. Thank you, Hassan. That was great. Um, Andrew, would you like to weigh in? Absolutely. Thank you. Um, I want to push just a bit on Dr. Abbas's uh, comments. I, I, I agree with him in, in, in many ways, including on the need he and Mustafa touched on for engagement from Western countries with the Taliban um, as the new political reality in a country that's vital to Asia, uh, that is the heart of Asia, as, as he poetically reminded us. I would say that in spite of the many problematic regimes that the United States deals with diplomatically and around the world, there is a unique severity to the way that the Taliban has imposed gender-based restrictions in Afghanistan. Nowhere else in the world do we see edicts handed down that deny a, a fundamental right to education. Nowhere else in the world do we see uh, restrictions on women's access to the public sphere, whether that's to jobs or, as Mustafa noted earlier, to simply travel uh, of their own volition. Uh, yes, there are countries where restrictions on women are quite severe and, and where women are punished by both state and society, but we do hope and expect and encourage uh, the states that we engage with to move in the right direction. And, and of course, the Taliban have been moving in nothing but the wrong direction uh, since they took power a year ago. I don't think that that changes the calculus that we all seem to agree on, that engagement is necessary. Um, the, the country of Afghanistan is important to regional stability and security. And, and as several of you have noted, I think there's an argument to be made that the United States should care about Afghanistan because of who Afghanistan's neighbors are and how much they care about Afghanistan and how central it is to the national interest of Iran, Russia, China, not just adversarial powers, but also allies and partners of ours, uh, India, Pakistan, Central Asian states and others. So yes, there's plenty of reason at a geostrategic level to stay plugged in, to uh, watch Afghanistan, before we even begin to address something, Sahar, that you touched on so well, which is our moral obligation to the Afghan people, this question of accountability of the last 20 years of war, of, of mismanagement and so many mistakes made during this intervention. Um, and we now have the Afghan people suffering for this, like no other humanitarian crisis or economic collapse anywhere else on earth. Um, one other thing I wanted to note on is to maybe draw out a little bit of how the Taliban themselves have tried to approach their foreign relations, uh, the, the prompt for the question. Um, the Taliban find themselves in a bind uh, because, as Mustafa noted, uh, their preference and, and what they would enjoy is an engagement with regional powers and neighboring states many of whom, like I've noted, uh, Russia, China, uh, uh, Pakistan following China's stead, uh, are not going to pressure the Taliban in the same way as Western states on these questions of human rights, of women's rights, of how they engage with their own population, uh, whether or not elections are held, etc. Um, the Taliban would love to manage a foreign policy where recognition, uh, outside legitimacy and, and the networks that they build can lean on those states that are more permissive to let the Taliban do whatever they were going to do. The Taliban's problem is that these regional powers and neighboring states are not the ones contributing the external aid, the foreign assistance that is still so vital to keeping Afghanistan's economy afloat and its population alive and preventing mass starvation, not to mention mass displacement and so many other challenges. It is still the Taliban's former adversaries being led by the United States, also the European Union and many of their members, 
that have pumped in hundreds of millions, uh, indeed well over a billion dollars in the last year, just to provide aid to the Afghan people. The Taliban are still grappling with how uh, to approach that. Uh, they would like to be able, as you noted, Sahar, they, they seek international legitimacy, but they haven't really demonstrated their willingness to change much of their behavior in order to earn it. Uh, that's starker when it comes to the United States and other Western states. The Taliban have been much more transactional uh, with regional powers. But a year on, and it's still unclear where the Taliban's own internal debate is going to land them on this question of how much to compromise and collaborate with the international community. Thank you, Andrew. That was really helpful. And, you know, I do agree with um, some points, Hassan, that you made and, and Andrew, you as well. And the one question, um, I have a few more questions, but I'm going to hold off and I'll get, um, we had a couple of questions in the Q&A about leverage. And so I've consolidated them. And the question I have for all of you now is, do the sanctions that the U.S. has 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 imposed on the Taliban, um, do those sanctions have any leverage? And what kind of leverage will the U.S. have if sanctions are lifted. And I think, um, as, you know, some of us uh, have already mentioned how sanctions should be lifted and that they, the sanctions are hurting Afghans more than the Taliban, etc. And so there are a few questions about that. So um, I'll leave it up to you who wants to answer it first. Um, but the question basically is, if sanctions are lifted, what kind of leverage does the United States have on the Taliban? Um, my own sort of view on this is I think that currently the U.S. has very very little leverage on the Taliban. Um, and I say this for several reasons, one of them simply being that, that the Taliban, of course, and as all of you have noted as well, that they haven't really changed their behavior. They haven't really changed their policies. And my sense from that is that they don't feel the need to change or they feel that they can continue on as they're going. And so the question within US policy circles has been what kind of leverage do we have? And I don't see any leverage developing if the U.S. does not engage with the Taliban or at least have some sort of diplomatic talks with the Taliban, sort of keep that track going, because without that track, it'd be very hard to figure out what the group is doing and why and what kind of interaction, what kind of common ground, if any, the U.S. and, and Taliban could find. But um, I'm interested in all of your views as well. So I whoever would like to go first can start. <laughs> sure, Hassan, I start. Can. Thank you so much. Um, and I wanted to go first because I want, uh, I stand corrected. I think Andrew was very right uh, that when it comes to the severity of challenges for women, human rights violations, massive, uh, there's no other uh, similar case. So, uh, Andrew, I agree with you entirely. Uh, and, and I sh uh, should have uh, framed that in that sense. But in, when it comes to dogmatism, authoritarianism, and um, challenges to minorities, Muslim or non-Muslim, there are other comparable cases uh, in the in the region also. And of course, what's happening in not only in Pakistan but India also, or or in the region, in the Gulf. Many of these countries are big countries, important countries. They would not like to hear this, and they are our partner nations. But uh, their track records are also terrible when it comes to at least minority issues and authoritarian issues. The, the you are absolutely right about um, that. We have relatively little leverage. But I also want to add this. We have leverage on some of the regional countries, which can play a role. And somehow I couldn't uh, or couldn't mention in detail uh, about the rise of Taliban, this issue, the role of Pakistan. I mean, uh, the role of Pakistan in the rise of Taliban was uh, very clear. It's very well documented. And let me put it for the lack of any other word, uh, Pakistan's role in the rise of Taliban in Afghanistan has been terrible. Uh, there's simply no other way to put it. Probably I'm using a soft word. And also, they, they, they uh, uh, were deeply involved in not only in supporting the, uh, the Taliban insurgency in some ways, but uh, lately also, since they rise, the, uh, the cabinet decisions and others. And Pakistan clearly uh, is, a, uh, is a player which is very well connected. It's a vital player. It's an important uh, U.S. partner in the region. Um, they, uh, they are involved in many things where U.S. has leverage on, on Pakistan or, or can have more and to push them to do the right thing when it comes to uh, women issues, for example. Um, also, I think in my understanding, as was rightly mentioned, Taliban have a very, this Taliban 3.0, for, for the lack of any other word, um, is they have a very well-defined international relations strategy, it seems. They, they don't have a good domestic 
political strategy yet. They are they're, they're unclear or indecisive uh, or confused. But on international relations, they are very clear. They are desperate to get support, it seems. And their desperation means we have some leverage in a, for a good creative cause, which is to tell them, yes, the money can be back or uh, some of the aid can happen or other in other. They need capacity building support also. I heard yesterday, uh, probably from Andrew, I'm sorry if I'm quoting you, but borrowing from you, uh, which is that uh, the Ministry of Interior there, uh, Siraj Hakani, and others are reaching out to some regional countries. They need support for their border controls, better management. So there are a lot of ways we can say we will provide you that, but the status of women, especially those curves, have to change. So we have that leverage, I think. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Fa, go ahead. Hi, Sahar. Uh, I mean, on this issue of sanctions, uh, I'll just speak also in general terms. I, I've observed that sanctions also in Iran, for example, and uh, in other countries leads to a kind of national sense of mobilization, right? I mean, the regime says we are under international pressure. It's unfair. The international system is unfair towards us. The imperialists are fighting us. That also helps them to solidify their support. That also help them, helps them explain away their own failures as something you know, pushed on the country by the international system. So I doubt that they ever help you know, uh, to, to, to come to any goals. Uh, and, and also, it, it is for groups like the Taliban, who take pride in having liberated their country from foreign occupation, uh, it's not also a probably doable thing to visibly, openly acknowledge some change so that the U.S. will officially leave these sanctions. For them, it will look like a failure or weakness. And uh, whereas I think Hassan, Hassan's point that U.S. can use other leverages through countries like Pakistan, it doesn't have to be visible. It doesn't have to be announced and it doesn't have to look like a failure on the Pakistan on the Taliban's part. That can be more effective. I think all those sanction mechanisms uh, and the policies and, and the arguments for them sometimes overlook how the picture is seen on the other side. I mean, when you put sanctions, does it really become an incentive? Precisely because you may have a sanction, you might be triggering certain uh, feelings of national pride and, uh, and conspiratorial explanation of the problems of that country. I've seen that in Turkey as well. I mean, there, there's no sanctions as such in Turkey, but the idea of any unfairness on Turkey leads to the, this, the perception of that or any manipulation on Turkey, even if it's, it's not generally real but perceived, leads only to only counterproductive effects of creating more nationalism in the country and making the population stand behind the very authoritarian government that you want to push for some, some good steps and makes them not take those steps precisely because it is asked for and pushed on them through, through the sanctions. Yes, I would agree with that. I think sanctions are, uh, I mean, personally, I think they should be lifted on Afghanistan. Um, and I think we've seen crippling effects on, on various countries like Iran and North Korea. Um, but this is also tied to sort of the other question we had. We've had quite a few in the Q&A, so I'm trying to consolidate them. Um, and the other question we've had is about the Taliban moderating their views. So basically, the question is, um, would the Taliban ever moderate their views? And would getting U.S. support make them more moderate? I'd be interested in your point of view, especially since we've been sort of talking about legitimacy and also, um, you know, whether or not the Taliban, um, they're, they're here to stay, we know that, but no country has officially recognized them as the official government. Um, I'm not advocating that we do recognize them, but um, I am curious to see what, what your views on if the U.S. ever increased its support of the Taliban and what that would mean for the group. Would they make, would they make themselves more moderate or would they um, become more entrenched in sort of their version um, of what Andrew um, so greatly calls calculated coercion? So Andrew, I'll start with you. Sure, thank you. And uh, I mean, there's a real, uh, there's a connection between the last question and, and everyone's thoughtful responses. And this one, um, which works better with the Taliban, the, the carrot or the stick? Um, I, I'm not an expert on US politics or, or the way the US uh, creates foreign policy, but 
as someone who watches Afghanistan closely, it seems pretty obvious that at least this administration and, and potentially the next one, there's going to be a lot of reluctance to enter into a warm, supportive, uh, you know, productive relationship with the Taliban. Um, if, if nothing else, you know, the revelation that Zawahiri, the leader of Al Qaeda, was being hidden and provided support and sanctuary in the capital city of Kabul, you know, when he was killed in the U.S. drone strike last month, that certainly sets things back and, and puts the relationship in one of mistrust and, and suspicion. Um, and so it's a bit of an academic question, but I think it's still an important one uh, it, because there are also a number of European partners and other Western states. I talked about th those donors who are investing the most in Afghanistan today. Uh, and the Europeans are on a bit of a different timeline on how they might engage with the Taliban. Uh, some of them are still are already quietly setting up uh, and reestablishing their embassy presence. Hassan noted that regional powers such as India are as well. Um, so the carrot or the stick with the Taliban, the truth is the Taliban have only inched forward on a great number of their incredibly conservative and, and even repressive social views. The changes that they have made in allowing education and allowing women in the workforce have often not come as a result of foreign pressure or of foreign incentives. They came because things were happening inside Afghanistan in local communities that compelled the Taliban to make a compromise with local communities with the Afghans that they were trying to work with. And, and that all came in a context where the Taliban felt like they had a war to win and compromises at times needed to be made. The Taliban might not feel like they needed to compromise with, uh, with, with the local communities and with the Afghan people in the same way now that they have a monopoly of force. When it comes to external carrots and sticks provided by outsiders, uh, the track record is discouraging. Uh, there's no guarantee that a long and consistent track record of supporting or encouraging or incentivizing the Taliban is going to produce major changes in their worldview or how they treat the Afghan population. But what we do have is a clear track record of the Taliban resisting the stick and of pushing back forcefully and as Mustafa noted, even building their ideology around a sense of pride that they resist external pressure uh, for them to change the way that they rule and the way that they operate. We don't know how carrots are going to work with the Taliban, but we know how the stick works. And the Taliban are very proud of the fact that they've resisted the American stick and, and lots of pain and punishment for the last 20 years. I didn't hear you, Sahar. Do you hear me? We all have technical issues today. You hear us? Yeah, she may still need to refresh. Um, I don't know, uh, Mustafa or or Dr. Abbas, uh, what do you think on, on this question of, of the carrot or the yes. stick? Mustafa, you would... You would... I mean, I agree. I mean, you put it very well. Uh, this, I mean, this carrots and sticks analogy is a very transactional thought, you know, and it's, it's a language, you know, that's very much established in, in Western political language, right? I mean, let's use carrots and sticks. And it's fundamentally not a wrong idea. But what is what is lacking in there is the psychology of the people and their and their pride and their narrative and their worldview which uh, will in, intuitively reject being manipulated, right? That's the whole narrative. Like we are the most authentic people. We, we fought the Soviets, we fought the, the NATO forces, Americans, we pushed them out. We are authentic Afghans. That's why we liberated the country from now. And now for a few pieces of bread, we will not do this, right? We will, we will not take steps. We will not change our understanding of fiqh. We will, not, we will still implement our Sharia in full although it's their own understanding and, of course, their own interpretation. 
So that psychology is very much there. Therefore, this cold narrative of here, here are the sanctions and we will, these sanctions will not change unless you do these things. And of course they will not do those, do, do those things because that's who they are. I mean, they take pride in not having bowed down and having resisted and pushed them out and so on and so forth. Uh, which doesn't mean that you should not still try to use mechanisms for for incentivizing uh, groups like that, but that should that always I think better works better with diplomacy that is silent and covert. You know, with with talks in Doha maybe, with, with with some conversations or with some Pakistanis maybe being in the way, even Turks or others who, who talk to the Taliban. That may be, especially most Muslim actors may be more influential on the Taliban than, than non-Muslim actors. Uh, that may be a better way. So uh, I do believe Western governments should use some approach of carrots and sticks, but not in, in the way it is traditionally understood as, you know, statements made by a press conference, hoping that the other side will say, oh, yeah, of course, we'll change our policy because you want us to do so. That's precisely not going to happen because it, because of the psychological dynamic of this relationship. Thank you, Mr. Biden. Hassan, you like to Absolutely, we can hear you, Sahar, whenever you want. I can. I can. So, um, th this reminds me of uh, this recent an example. Uh, we know that uh, Pakistan sent a delegation of Deobandi scholars, including some of the teachers of the top Taliban leaders today. Uh, that that was, I think, a way they would probably went for their own domestic reason because Pakistan wants Afghan Taliban to help them uh, uh, get rid of or tackle the Pakistani Taliban. Who, the Pakistani Taliban were on the Pakistani side of the border in the Pakistani tribal belt. They found sanctuary in Afghanistan and they have an old linkage between themselves. The most interesting thing is we are still waiting for the real insights to come, but apparently it didn't work. And it was so interesting that why um, Afghan Taliban would not even listen to their um, uh, the head of the seminaries uh, who they'll still need their help because Taliban, Afghan Taliban need the Pakistani Taliban more because Pakistani Taliban, some of them uh, would uh, had given them sanctuary in the tribal belt. So in this case, their military need uh, it was turned out to be more important than their ideological connection with the Pakistani Deobandis. Again, this is anecdotal, but that gives us one side. Secondly, so I'm uh, borrowing from or deducting from this that why they didn't listen to their Deobandi masters and they listened to, uh, they, they tried still to save their partners who are militants because their needs are military. They want to push back ISK. And that is the leverage because Taliban severe threat at this moment uh, that is from ISK and to push them back there might be some counterterrorism related cooperation now we have to be extremely careful of what that means again I have no evidence to support that but you never know if there was some internal support that allowed us to hit uh, Zawahiri right in the heart of Kabul um, there might be some uh, support from within Taliban so Taliban need or some faction of Taliban need our support or our support means our partner support uh, somebody in the region turkey um, somebody else um, who can help uh, tackle uh, the isk or be effective so that will be another area uh, where we can use um, carrots uh, uh, to to help taliban and then uh, in return you see some progress on issues of our interest on human rights especially Thank you, Hassan. I actually have one um, last question. We've had uh, quite a few Q and A um, questions online from all of you. So, uh, viewers, thank you so much for listening. And of course, if you are going to be using social media for the event, please use the hashtag #CatoFP. Um, and so, some of the questions I've had have actually been related to Afghans. And so, I want to shift gears a little bit, a, a little away from the Taliban. I'm not quite away, but you know, uh, just a little away from the Taliban. And the question I have for you is. What happened to the Afghans who helped U.S. forces and how can the U.S. help those wanting to leave Afghanistan? Um, I'd love to hear from all three of you sort of your point of view on this, um, on sort of what should have been done or what is being done or, or just your understanding of that. Um, so Mustafa, I'm happy to go with you first. I mean, I know a few Afghans who had to leave uh, Afghanistan right away uh, in, in those military planes that you may probably have all seen. 
uh, photos. Uh, one of them actually was the head of a think tank in Afghanistan who was a think tank dedicated to civil and economic liberties, you know, promoting those ideas within an Islamic framework. But uh, that that wasn't safe, so he had to leave, and and ultimately he was able to come to the United States. But I know there are so many Afghan uh, refugees who are, have not been able to get a visa yet, and who are going through difficult uh, waiting periods. I mean, um, the friend I, I mentioned had to wait in Turkey for a while, but he was ultimately lucky to come recently to the United States. I mean, uh, those people. I mean, especially the people who work with. Uh, the U.S. forces uh, there, or NATO, let's say broadly, general speaking, uh, they are certainly on the threat. I mean, we see Taliban having these uh, revenge attacks. I mean, like uh, people executing people without any even court. Uh, so that has happened to more than more than a few hundred people. I mean, as as the Human Rights Watch recently documented. So there are a lot of people who would be on the threat there, and. I think uh, their uh, processes should be really uh, expedited and those people need to be brought safely. I know some are here and there are people working on it, just not just the government, but also colleges, institutions, other other organizations, and that's all welcome. But uh, but but the bureaucracy can be sometimes too slow in these in these issues. Uh, I know as a you know, from my personal processes as well. So it is important that, uh, you know, these things are expedited and the people in danger are brought to security, safety. Thanks, I would agree with that. And I know that um, the United States had a special immigrant visa or the SIV in which um, thousands of Afghans and, and, and um, Iraqis also had applied. Um, and there's been a backlog on that, which has been really unfortunate. And this backlog didn't just begin last year when the US forces withdrew, but it has sort of continued on. So I think one of the things that I've sort of written about and also recommended is that the SIV process be accelerated. And for those Afghans, especially who, who want to leave, um, or especially those who were translators and interpreters for U.S. forces, one of the promises made to them was that they would be able to leave Afghanistan and, and potentially live in the United States and elsewhere. And so I think, at, at least from a U.S. perspective, that should be something that the U.S. is a promise that the U.S. made and they should they should uphold. Um, currently, there are, there are thousands of Afghan, Afghans who have uh, managed to immigrate to the United States. Many are still in lingo, um, are in limbo. And so this has been a, a big problem for, for Afghan families as well. And many of them, of course, are also suffering through um, PTSD and, and other mental health issues that they've, as they sort of had to flee the violence and potentially be in, lim in limbo with their, with their families as well. Um, one of the last questions we have, we have about five, six more minutes left. So I, I think that gives us some um, time for another question. We've had a couple of questions on on Pakistan, um, and I think sometimes it's it's difficult to talk about the Taliban without having some mention of, of Pakistan. And this is something that both um, all three of you actually mentioned in your comments and in some of the answers um, that you that you have uh, presented to the various questions. But the last question is is on on Pakistan, which is what kind of leverage does Pakistan have on the Taliban, and um, what kind of uh, leverage, if any, does the U.S. have on Pakistan? in terms of improving its relationship with the Taliban. So Hassan, I'll start with you, since I know that you're um, an expert on Pakistan as well. Thank you so much. Uh, what I am hearing so far, again, in reference to my interviews about my, from my book, um, what I am getting the feedback from the Pakistani defense side, uh, military and intelligence, they are giving the impression that um, they, are, they have been taken by surprise. Uh, in some ways, the Taliban are not listening to them the way they thought they would. And in fact, on Pakistani Taliban is one issue. There are other issues as well, uh, where there is a pushback. A and we know from the previous case also, Mullah Omar, when he had, uh, the first time he invited some of the Pakistani diplomats, I think Mr. Riaz Khan had written a, in his book um, about, they were surprised how they were uh, uh, rude uh, with, uh, with the Pakistanis. I think there is a challenge. Uh, there is a general perception in Afghanistan among the Taliban also that Pakistan had played a very important role or that Pakistan and Taliban are very close. And Taliban want to show that they are totally independent and there is an internal reaction to this Im image. So that has lessened Pakistan's leverage. Um, but still, if there is any country in that region, if there is a priority list who have the most influence, Pakistan is on top, Qatar is number two, Iran is number three. 
um, and with with Qatar still uh, we have the leverage. But in case of Pakistan, um, I personally believe that the establishment's view is one thing, but Pakistan through because they're getting in, uh, uh, importing coal, there's many financial links. Many Pakistani advisors have gone into Afghanistan to help Taliban. I think Pakistan can still help, and Pakistan is responsible for not for United States sake or anybody else, but for the sake of the region. Whenever there was more radicalization and extremism in Afghanistan, it came into Pakistan. Or when there was extremist groups allowed to operate in Pakistan, they found a sanctuary in Afghanistan. So Pakistan, for their own sake, um, should act more responsibly, I would say. Thank, thank you, Hassan, for that. Anybody else want to weigh in? I just would like to ask a question to Hassan. If, oh, but and, did I cut, Andrew? Just briefly, Hassan, does the uh, Afghanistan model right now inspire Islamic Islamist groups in Pakistan in the sense that that's a better Islamic state that, than we have here in Pakistan? So the real thing, like, does, does, the, does the Taliban success or has it so far in the past year had a spillover effect into the Pakistan Islamic scene in the past year? Because as you said, there are these two countries are deeply connected. Uh, yes, the brief answer is absolutely. Um, the the, the Uvandi Sunni groups, uh, especially the madrasas from where many of these uh, folks were uh, graduates of, Haqqani, uh, uh, Madrasa and others, they're not only very happy, um, they think that they have this now additional uh, uh, support and additional uh, strategic depth uh, on, on the other side in Afghanistan. So. It is uh, impacting, and this is going to impact more. Um, and that's a strange, uh, ironic uh, tragedy. If the uh, Taliban in Afghanistan are, are more successful, it will lead to more power for some of the very hardliner, conservative, and extremist groups in Pakistan as well. That that is a reality, unfortunately. Yeah. Thank you. And I'll just like to weigh in on that as well. I agree with Hassan, but I think one thing to sort of um, make a, a distinction between Afghanistan and Pakistan, of course, is Pakistan does have elections. Um, the current prime minister, of course, is a caretaker prime minister. Prime Minister Imran Khan was, was ousted in April, but Pakistan still has elections where you get some idea of what, what Pakistani people want and who they want as a representative, which is basically, a, I think, a right that exists that Afghans have not been afforded. And, and this is something, of course, all three of you touched on, especially Andrew, um, about how the Taliban don't have any desire for elections. And I think they've come out very openly and said that they don't believe in any other stakeholder being um, part of, of Afghanistan's political um, scene because they are the legitimate rulers of Afghanistan. That's how they see themselves. And that's kind of how the system has been designed as well. That this is something that I think um, religious groups in Pakistan would like to see for themselves. But at the ballot box, religious political parties and religious groups have not seen success in Pakistan at all, um, which is sort of a separate discussion of then how do they have the leverage that they do. But when it comes to being elected, they've failed um, sort of in, in all elections and in, in, in winning seats. Um, but um, I'll turn it over to Andrew if he had any last comments about this or uh, the yeah. previous question. Thank you. Well, on on the United States, you know, unfortunately, for so much of the last twenty years of war, the the question of what to do about the Taliban uh, often turned into or evolved into the question of, since nothing we the United States are doing seems very effective, what could we perhaps convince Pakistan to do about the Taliban? And I think there's just as much history in the last 20 years of realizing that that question often didn't lead us anywhere very productive in terms of our policy or pressure on Pakistan either. Um, I think the historical record shows there were limits to how much Pakistan could prompt uh, the Taliban. As Mustafa noted, an incredibly important point about the psychology uh, and the, the notion of pride in the Taliban earlier this is a group that is now going to define itself. It's going to create its own mythology about how it resisted the world's only superpower. And part of resisting outside influence isn't just the United States, which it you know, claims it defeated uh, on the battlefield, 
it also includes resisting Pakistan. And we've seen the Taliban do that over and over in the past year, trying to convince themselves and the Afghan people that not only are they not a puppet of the Pakistani state, but that they will reject foreign influence from Pakistan, just like anywhere else. It, it, it makes that question of turning to Pakistan for support more difficult than ever, I think. Well, on that note, we're at time. And I wanted to thank all of you, um, Andrew, Hassan, Mustafa, for your expertise and your time this afternoon. For all of you listening, thank you again for tuning in and for um, asking your questions. I hope that I got through all of them and through all of the main points. Um, of course, Afghanistan remains on our minds. The Taliban and its evolution remains on our minds as well. And I would urge all of us to not just think about the Taliban when there's an anniversary to think about, but also to think about the plight of the Afghan people and also what can we do to hold U.S. policymakers and, and military leaders accountable for the U.S. war in Afghanistan? And finally, how to engage with the Taliban? I think the 20-year war um, that the U.S. waged in Afghanistan has proven one thing, which is the Taliban are going nowhere. They're here to stay, and that basically means that we have to find a constructive way to engage with them. What that means, only time will tell. But thank you so much for tuning in and for listening and for your support.